Hello everybody, my name is JC and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar entitled Greenhouse Environmental Management. This webinar is geared towards helping people who are planning greenhouse projects select the optimal structures and components that will contribute to maintaining an optimal environment for their plant growth. It's also for existing farmers and farms that need to develop strategies to also grow their crops as well as possible without the risk of failure. Let's begin, shall we? We'll start with the definition of greenhouses and their intended purpose. Then we'll move on to the environmental parameters to control and the essential tools that help us do so. Next, we'll be looking at the forms and components of environmental control. After that, the various types of greenhouses and their unique features. And then we'll be ending with some strategies for greenhouse environmental control under different scenarios. Greenhouse definition and purpose. Greenhouses are essentially structures that make use of natural light and create an environment where parameters can be controlled. The more control you need, the higher the complexity of the components you'll be working with and their associated costs. Why use a greenhouse? Well, they're generally used for high value and non-native crops that would normally have a hard time growing in a given environment. Greenhouses can provide the control necessary to grow plant crops profitably and consistently, allowing the farmer to maintain contracts year-round with their clients. Parameters to control and essential tools. The first important environmental parameter is water. As we know, plant roots take up water while their leaves give out water. And so root zone moisture content must be maintained within an optimal range for healthy roots and optimal growth rates in plants. Excess and insufficient moisture in the root zone both affect plant health and growth rates and they can result in acute stress responses that reduce the crop quality and yield, thereby losing people money. Wetting foliage in a rain event, for example, decreases transpirational rates and results in slower growth and higher disease susceptibility because a lot of microorganisms have an easier time attacking plants when their leaves are wet. Using moisture sensors and rain gauges, you can track how much water is coming from rain, and how much needs to be added to the soil or soilless medium for optimal moisture content contributing to healthy growth. Next, we'll take a look at wind and airflow, which is another important environmental parameter. Wind speed can affect how plants transpire, so it must be maintained within an optimal range for optimal growth. You see, excess airflow contributes to high vapor pressure deficits and can physically damage crops while reducing water usage efficiency significantly. Insufficient airflow, on the other hand, contributes to low vapor pressure deficits and can slow transpiration and growth while increasing the likelihood of disease incidence. To measure air speed, you need an anemometer. These come in handheld and stationary versions, but they can give you an idea of very localized airflow patterns in the greenhouse so that if you experience any of the situations we just mentioned, you can take action and make changes. Next, we'll take a look at light. Light is an interesting and very important environmental parameter, and we're able to control certain aspects of it with greenhouses. Namely, light intensity and spectrum affect plant transpiration and physiological signaling, and must be controlled for optimal growth. This is a very crop-specific effect, and it's a large subject on its own. Excess light can reduce transpirational efficiency, raise foliage temperatures, and damage the photosynthetic apparatus, causing excess water loss in addition to stress responses. Insufficient light, on the other hand, can decrease transpiration rates, slow growth, and induce unwanted stretching in plant shoots that usually lowers their quality. To measure the intensity of the light you're receiving from the sun in the greenhouse, you need to have a quantum PAR meter. 
and make sure that it's full spectrum. If you decide that you want to have an idea of the spectrum of light that you're receiving, then you actually have to have a spectrum analyzer. Next, we'll talk about temperature. Now, air, leaf, and root temperature all affect transpiration and plant growth, and they must be controlled for optimal growth. Excess heat increases water loss and lowers growth rates in addition to causing stress responses such as bolting and tip burn in cool weather crops. Insufficient heat decreases transpiration and lowers enzymatic rates in plants and therefore can dramatically slow growth rates and make crops no longer on schedule. To measure temperature, you have temperature sensors designed for the air and the root zone and you also have infrared thermometers which are very handy in determining what the temperature of the foliage is. Now healthy crops that are using water from their roots to cool themselves will have a lower leaf temperature than the surrounding surfaces around them. Humidity is the next important environmental parameter to pay attention to. Relative humidity affects transpiration and disease pressure so it must be controlled for optimal growth as well. Excess humidity lowers vapor pressure deficits and transpiration while increasing disease incidence. Extreme low humidity increases vapor pressure deficit and transpiration resulting in water loss and stress responses that can be damaging. To keep track of relative humidity you simply need a hygrometer which will tell you the relative humidity in a localized place or microclimate where it's placed. Carbon dioxide is usually of little concern within most greenhouses, but the plants do use it for growth. So in certain scenarios you want to make sure that it's not being depleted because the concentration of carbon dioxide in the air affects plant growth rates and their tolerance of high temperatures and light intensities. To keep track of that, you simply need a carbon dioxide monitor, which will tell you in parts per million where your CO2 concentrations are at a given place at a given time. This is not so much an environmental parameter, but it is related. Now crop pests and pathogens can be severely damaging to crops and farmers' incomes. So when crop health is already hindered by less than ideal environmental conditions, these issues are more likely to take hold and inflict economic damage. Environmental controls, as well as physical exclusions, therefore, contribute to a reduction of the risk of crop pest infestation and pathogen infection. So there's some overlap with the environmental controls that we'll be talking about. To keep an eye on what insects and pathogens may be present in your greenhouse, here are a few useful tools to consider. Sticky traps that either come in yellow or blue colors can be representative of what insects are found in your greenhouse. They will trap and eventually kill a certain number of these insects and contribute towards preventing the spread, but they need to be checked regularly so that you know if any of these things are present. When you find that insect pests are present, you need to use a magnifying loop so that you can identify them and this will help in determining the course of action that comes next. It's also advisable to have a microscope in the greenhouse and we now have some nice wireless varieties that can work with your phone or laptop and these can help you take a very close look at things to determine let's say whether there are insect eggs on your crop or if a certain pathogen is causing issues and identify what it is to help you with your strategy. Forms and components of environmental control. Now greenhouse glazing is basically the material that is covering the majority of the greenhouse, usually the top portion of it or the roof. The first glazing we're going to be looking at today is polyethylene film. It comes either extruded as a plastic film or woven, which is usually actually more durable. It's a very low cost glazing. It's low weight. It usually provides low insulation on its own and has low durability. 
It also has a short lifespan, and it can be transparent or diffuse, allowing in various degrees of light. The next greenhouse glazing we'll be looking at is glass. And there are various grades of standard and safety glass. Now, this comes at a high cost. It also has a high weight, requiring a stronger structure to support it. Usually also provides low insulation. It has low durability in instances where debris or hail are an issue. However, it has a very, very long lifespan and it can be transparent or diffuse, but it allows in usually quite a lot of light. Another option for greenhouse glazing are polycarbonate and acrylic panels. Now these are plastics that uh, are generally quite expensive. They come at a high cost. They're medium in weight between glass and the polyethylene film. They can provide d various levels of high insulation, unless we're talking about the single layer corrugated variety. They're usually quite high in durability as well, have a medium lifespan of around 20 years, and they can be transparent or diffuse as well. From the picture on the bottom right, you can see how certain types can also be bent to a certain degree. Some newer glazings that I want to talk about briefly include F-Clean, which has a medium cost, a low weight, low insulation, but high durability and a long lifespan and is extremely transparent. This is malleable and can be adapted to a variety of situations. Then you also have ETFE, which stands for ethylene tetrafluoroethylene. Now this has a high cost, a medium weight, high insulation, high durability, a very long lifespan, and it can be extremely transparent unless you choose a diffuse variety. This has traditionally been used in architectural buildings where people didn't want to use glass, and now they're being adapted for greenhouse use because they're quite appropriate. Now it's time to take a look at ventilation systems. In a nutshell, louvered or static vents on the roof or the side walls of a greenhouse are ways to allow air out passively, either through thermodynamics or pressure. Air moves from lower to higher temperatures and from higher to lower pressures. To actively ventilate greenhouses, you need exhaust fans or turbines. Fans can be seen on the lower left on this greenhouse wall, end wall, gable, and on the bottom right, you can see turbines at the top ridge of that greenhouse pulling out hot air using wind power. Circulation systems are also very important for maintaining the optimal levels of airflow velocity within the greenhouse at the crop level. These generally come in two types, and you have horizontal airflow fans, like those you can see on the left here, and vertical airflow fans. Horizontal airflow fans are much more common and are usually adequate for mixing the air in the greenhouse and keeping the air moving around the foliage to displace moisture and disrupt the moisture barrier so that they can breathe. Vertical airflow fans have the advantage of being able to penetrate deeper into a greenhouse plant canopy. However, they risk sending hot air from the top of the greenhouse down into the crop, which can be unfavorable under certain circumstances. Heating systems are the next important component that we need to be looking at. Hydronic or water-based heating systems heat water by various means and send it through pipes in the greenhouse where it heats up the air from bottom to top. So they're generally placed below plants or plant benches. Convection systems are usually either electric or propane gas powered and they heat the air and blast it forward throughout the greenhouse and the circulation system helps mix this with the rest of the air. Radiant heating systems, including infrared heaters, heat surfaces. So instead of heating the air, you can heat the plant crop canopy directly. Now we need to take a look at cooling systems. In dry climates, it's very common to use evaporative cooling methods. That means cooling the air by adding water vapor to it. 
As water vaporizes from liquid to gas, it actually absorbs a lot of heat with it and stores that as latent heat, and it's no longer sensible by a thermometer, for example. So the first example here on the top right is a pad and fan system. On one side of the greenhouse, you will have these pads that are usually made of a cellulose material, and water is pumped over them when needed. On the other side of the greenhouse, you will have fans that are pushing air from the inside to the outside, creating a negative pressure. In a sealed greenhouse, this will draw air through the pads, adding moisture and cooling the air compared to the outside ambient air and moving it across the crop. Swamp coolers are a different version of this where this process happens internally and the more moist, humid, cooler air is sent to the greenhouse without it having to be sealed. Fogging systems are an advanced evaporative cooling method and they use a high pressure to disperse water at a very fine small droplet size so that it doesn't land on the foliage and make it wet but it also contributes moisture to the air and cools it by the means of which I just explained. An interesting development recently has been the NVAC system or naturally ventilated augmented cooling. This works by misting water over a secondary membrane inside the greenhouse which causes the air surrounding it to pick up moisture, cool down, and drop to the bottom of the greenhouse where it moves through the greenhouse and raises again towards the vents when it picks up heat. It's a very low energy system. In humid climates, you can't use evaporative cooling because the capacity for air to pick up water is very, very low, so that kind of cooling will not be very effective. In addition, you might end up with extremely high relative humidities, and these can be conducive to disease incidents. So in humid climates, you may have to rely on refrigerant or compressor-based cooling, and that is known as air conditioning, which is a very expensive method to run because it takes a lot of electricity constantly. In the event that this is not economical, you might try using the method of root zone cooling, which means cooling the water that is irrigating the crops so that the water moving through the crops is able to take on more of their heat and alleviate the heat stress. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. Insect netting, or screens, are available in a variety of mesh ratings. So the smaller the holes, the fewer insects can get through, and the higher the cost of the mesh. With smaller holes, the resistance to airflow is also higher, so you have to make sure that this trade-off is not causing you issues when excluding pests results in excluding some of the natural ventilation that would occur through these screens. Top right here you can see roof vents on a greenhouse covered in accordion screens so that no pests are able to enter through these openings. Shade cloths are available in various transmission percentages. That means that you can choose the shade cloth that reduces the light by a percentage that creates an optimal environment for your plants. By measuring the outside average and maximum sunlight intensities and comparing it to what you actually need for your crop to grow healthy, you can apply the appropriate reduction in lighting intensity. Now shade cloths can be installed inside or outside the greenhouse as static or movable systems. In some cases, shade paint can also be deployed onto the glazing itself. This is not conducive to having a dynamic system, so once it's on there, it is what it is until you remove it, but you can get very, very precise degrees of shading and that has its own benefits. Hydroponics and soilless cultivation systems. While these are not methods of environmental control, they are root zone management tools to control the moisture, temperature, oxygen, and fertilizer at the root zone. They can increase the efficiency and sustainability of your greenhouse. What they 
function to do mainly is in exclude insect pests, nematodes, and pathogens that may be harming your plants and prevent their damage. Types and features of greenhouses. The first type of greenhouse we'll be visiting is not a true greenhouse, but it's called a shade house. The singular function of a shade house structure is to reduce light intensity. It's for when all you really concerned about is the excess light intensity that would be harming your crops or losing you a lot of water. And so they can help in nurseries, for example, keep cut plants that are needing to be rooted or nursery plugs in partial shade until they need to be sold. Sometimes it's also useful for slowing growth so that things can stay within the right phase before they're being sold at a certain size. Another low-tech type of greenhouse is called a net house. The singular purpose of a net house structure is to exclude crop pests and confine beneficial insects for pollination and or integrated pest management. So this consists of just insect netting and it keeps out bad insects and keeps in the ones that you've paid for to actually perform a function on your crop. Moving up in complexity, we'll take a look at high tunnels. The high tunnel is a low cost structure with no active climate control. Most often covered in polyethylene film, it serves to shelter the foliage from rain, diffuse the light and reduce shadowing within the greenhouse, and warm the air for season extension without heaters. They usually have side vents that can be pulled up manually when the temperatures ri rise at the middle of the day, for example. And care has to be taken not to run into extremely high relative humidities in these scenarios, because if they are closed and the sun comes out and plants are transpiring, you will see water essentially condensing on the plastic film and dripping onto the crop, which can have negative outcomes. In grapes, for example, researchers have seen a tripling of growth and biomass production and yields in grapes in a high tunnel compared to identical grapes right outside in the elements. So even though they are low cost, low tech, and passive, they can have massive benefits in certain circumstances. True greenhouses. These can be open, semi-closed, or closed. And it is as these terms suggest, basically, open to the outside air, semi-closed, which means controlled through vents and open some of the time, or closed so that they're entirely sealed and all of the air that goes in and out goes through an engineered HVAC system. Greenhouses can also be single span or multi-span. Multi-span means greenhouse modules that are attached right next to each other, sharing walls and creating a large open space it can increase efficiency at scale. Greenhouses can be gutter connected to harvest rainwater that falls on the roof as well. The first type of true greenhouse that we're going to be looking at is the Quonset structure. They're characterized by a rounded gable and are usually glazed with polyethylene film. They have sidewall vents that can be motorized and automated or manually operated. They have fairly low snow and wind load capacities, so they're not appropriate for places where extreme snow and wind is an issue. And they can be single or multi-span, as you can see from the photos provided here. The A-frame greenhouse is a very common type of greenhouse. It's quite traditional. It comprises a pitched roof, which means slanted equally on both sides with a sharp ridge. It's either glazed in glass or polycarbonate glazing normally. The vents are primarily on the roof and these have a much higher snow load capacity. They can be single or multi-span. Next we take a look at Venlo or Dutch style greenhouses. They're very similar to A-frames although you can see that proportionally the sidewalls are much, much higher. 
They comprise a pitched roof, are generally glazed with glass because they want to let in as much light as possible at high latitudes. And the roof vents will be passively allowing the hot air to leave the greenhouse when they're opened in a controlled fashion. The high truss roof raises heat above the crop and this creates passive airflow through natural thermodynamics which can decrease the costs of circulation within the greenhouse. Next we'll take a look at solar greenhouses also known as Chinese style or sawtooth. These generally have an asymmetrical roof and are oriented from east to west instead of north to south. They can have polycarbonate or polyethylene glazing and they maximize light reflection off the back north wall and insulation because the east, west and north side can be materials that are not transparent and have much higher insulation since you don't need light coming from those directions. These are generally however single span and modular arrangements of these greenhouses will have spaces between greenhouse modules and this can actually help for isolating different crops and environments and then if you have an issue with pests and diseases it will be confined to one of the greenhouses instead of the entire farm. Now we need to take a look at the Gothic arch style greenhouse. Now these have a rounded roof with a point at the ridge. They can take on polycarbonate or polyethylene glazing, high snow load capacities, and vents on the roof unless pad and fan cooling is used. They can be single or multi-span. Now we must take a look at tropical greenhouses. These generally have slanted static roof vents. They're always open because you don't ever anticipate cold temperatures and the need to close them. They're slanted, however, so that rainfall doesn't enter the greenhouse through these vents. They generally have polyethylene glazing and screen sidewalls and gables. They make use of passive ventilation and they can be single or multi-span and are usually gutter connected so that when it does rain you can harvest this high quality water. Next we'll take a look at geodesic domes. There are no gables or sidewalls on these structures. They can be polycarbonate or polyethylene glazed and they maximize light at extreme latitudes. In the winter there's very little light in general, so you'll be using supplemental lighting in these scenarios. But in the summer, in Alaska, for example, or near the poles, you have the sun that literally rotates in the sky, and so will be hitting the greenhouse from every possible angle, and you want to make the most use of this. These greenhouses have minimal vents for maximal warming effect, and generally are not concerned with cooling. They are, however, limited to a small scale, as it's very hard to build this greenhouse over a large acreage and you would instead deploy multiple small modules. The retractable roof greenhouse is an interesting solution in some places. It features a wire suspended roof with only malleable glazings that can be pulled on steel cables and open and close over the course of just a few minutes. They usually have very low insulation capacity and are also normally multi-span. This is a good solution for very high acreages that you want to cover at a low cost, perhaps for increasing the productivity of soil or field production crops. Next, we'll take a look at advanced fabric tensile structures. Now these are the most advanced and highly customizable greenhouse type. The structure and the membranes are engineered to withstand the harshest conditions imaginable. They're modular, though generally single span only, and be, can be connected through tunnels as seen on the bottom right here. 
these greenhouses can truly be adapted to any environment possible and depending on where you're using it and the budget and the crop you will be using different components of environmental control to make it suitable for your needs. Although the least common they're very very interesting and we should talk about custom conservatories which are the types of greenhouses you see that are not generally for plant production but for plant display. So a lot of botanical gardens for example will have greenhouses that are architectural marvels and they are not exactly cost viable for any sort of farmers but they create wonderful lush environments outside of their original locations. Strategies for greenhouse environmental control. The important considerations when devising strategies for greenhouse environmental control are what crop you plan on growing and what value this crop has at market. You also have to consider the scale at which you will be operating, the budget available to you for setup, and the environment and the seasonality of your climate. It's also important to take a look at available resources. In other words, what is available in terms of power, water, equipment, and labor, and what are their local costs? Let's take an example scenario where we're talking about a tropical climate close to the equator, the seasonality is negligible because nothing changes very much over the course of the year. You might be experiencing a lot of wind. Temperatures will generally be very, very high. In a lot of cases, humidities will also be very high. And light levels for most of your greenhouse crops will be excessive. Pest and disease pressure can also be very, very high here. So let's take a look at the strategies that you might deploy in this scenario. Bear in mind, there is nothing detailed about this strategy that I'm laying out here. My intention is to simply help you think about what's important when approaching these problems. First, you need to lay out your top priorities. So, in this scenario, reducing light intensity is very important, as is reducing wind speed and temperature, and controlling pest and disease pressure. And the primary line of defense there is exclusion, which means keeping these things out of your greenhouse so that you don't have to treat them. The approach, therefore, in general, will be a diffuse glazing because you can afford the loss of light and you do want to eliminate any shading in the greenhouse. You'll also likely have static shading because the light levels are always high. You don't need to invest in a system that moves the shading in and out. To maximize light. Insect screens will be very important in this environment and uh, you need to deploy the insect screens that you can afford, especially based on the pests that you anticipate having to exclude. Hydroponics with root zone cooling will also be a very valuable tool in this scenario as it can allow you to get away with not actually cooling the greenhouse air as much, which can save a lot of energy and cost over the long run. So, if you have a high budget or a relatively high value crop, you may opt for a closed greenhouse that operates only with filtered air from the outside, going through an air conditioning system using electrical energy, and this will allow you to actually supplement with carbon dioxide and recover your carbon dioxide instead of letting it exit the greenhouse without being recycled. In this case, you will likely want to go with a high insulation glazing because you're paying for cooling and the greenhouse is sealed. So you want to lose as little cooling as possible and keep the heat out of the greenhouse. If you have a low budget or a relatively low value crop, you might opt for an open tropical greenhouse with screened air. In this case, you would be relying heavily on shading for your cooling as well as light reduction and root zone cooling which as I mentioned is a more efficient way to alleviate the heat stress that your crops may be experiencing. In this case you have no interest in insulating through glazing 
so you'll be able to use lower cost, low insulation glazings. The second example scenario, if we find ourselves in a desert climate or region, seasonality here is also negligible. The microclimate may also be windy and temperatures will generally be very high in the daytime and fairly medium at night. Humidities will usually be very low all year round. Light levels are likely again to be excessive for your crops and pest and disease pressures here can be much lower than in the tropics. Your top priorities in this case are again reducing light intensity, reducing the wind speed so you can reduce your water loss, increasing humidity for a change, and definitely reducing the temperature. The approach will be to use diffuse glazing, glazing and shading. Evaporative cooling can definitely be deployed in this case, and it would be helpful to have a wind block. So, if you have a high budget, or a high value crop, you can again use a closed greenhouse with filtered air keeping out the dust and associated pathogen risks. Fogging systems can be deployed here for very precise evaporative cooling and allow you to recover your CO2 that you may be supplementing to the crop. And you may also want to have a dynamic shading system so that in the morning and the evening when light levels are fairly low you have no shade over your greenhouse and then in the middle of the day when it's absolutely vital for reducing light intensity and heat infrared radiation you can move your shading in it can even be multi-level so that you get different grades of shade as you desire them if you have a low budget or a low value crop then a shade house or retractable roof greenhouse may be in order as these will take care of reducing the light intensity and reducing the temperature to a degree. A misting system would be helpful and there are low cost, low pressure systems that will simply wet the crop as much as needed to avoid suffering from extremely low humidities and the damage that comes from that. You're definitely going to want a low insulation glazing and it may be helpful to have some sort of mesh even if it's not for insects it'll be for wind reduction on the walls or around the greenhouse perimeter. The third example scenario. We find ourselves in a high latitude climate and region this time. Seasonality is now extremely pronounced. In other words, there's a huge difference between summer conditions and winter conditions. And you need to account for both of these in your greenhouse design and environmental management. Your microclimate might include heavy snowfall, and the flooding that occurs when the snow is actually melting. Temperatures are likely to be low to medium year-round. Humidities will also be low to medium. Light levels here will often be insufficient and can increase to adequate levels. Pest and disease pressure here is medium. It's not as high as in certain environments, but it is definitely something to pay attention to and monitor internally. The strategy for this scenario includes the top priorities of maximizing light intensity through a glazing that has high transmittance, increasing temperature with heating systems and the greenhouse effect, and definitely choosing a structure that has a high snow load capacity since this is a vital concern. The approach includes transparent glazing and supplemental lighting. In the winter you will likely not have enough light to grow your crops and meet your crop schedules. So you'll want to have supplemental lighting modules that are permanently hung in the greenhouse they come in various forms and there's been a lot of advances in LEDs recently so their cost is decreasing. These lighting fixtures will have a low profile so that they don't provide any shading to the crop by accident. You're also going to want to have very robust heating system here. 
and in a lot of cases these greenhouses in these environments will be built next to other businesses that have heat as a byproduct so that they can buy or harvest heat from cogeneration as it's called to use for their own greenhouse. In the summer you're likely to be able to use evaporative cooling through the variety of means that we've mentioned. If you have a high budget or a high value crop then you're likely to choose a closed pitched roof greenhouse with filtered air. You want one of the various heating systems that you view to be appropriate and that you can afford for your crop and again you'll have the ability to supplement and recover carbon dioxide for maximizing growth rates. You definitely want as transparent of a glazing as you can get as well as high insulation if you can have both so that you're reducing your operational costs and maximizing the growth potential. If you have a low budget or a low crop value you're likely to go for a semi-closed greenhouse with louvered vents. So you're taking in outside air through lower vents on the walls and then letting out hot humid air from the top through the roof vents and these will open and close they can be manually operated or automated depending on your budget. In some cases double polyethylene glazed gothic arch systems are appropriate because they're very low cost glazing but can provide quite a bit of insulative potential through inflating the layer between these two sheets of plastic. Your light transmission in this case will definitely be reduced but it's a matter of weighing the options and deciding what is more important to the business that is the farm and what you can afford to do in each scenario. The fourth example scenario that we're talking about today is going to be in a subtropical region. So you'll have a dry hot season usually through the winter and spring and then there will also be a rainy or cool season. Now this may pose very high risks of hurricanes, storms, typhoons and things like this that need to be taken into account. So temperatures will be high to medium, humidities will be medium to high, and light levels will be excessive to adequate. Generally pest and disease pressure in these places is also very high and is definitely a concern. For this strategy our top priority is going to be controlling light intensity, reducing wind and storm damage, and reducing pest and disease pressure. The approach is to use diffuse glazing and shading, a wind resistant structure that can handle the worst conditions that you are expecting throughout the year, very fine insect screens to avoid issues with pests, and hydroponics with root zone cooling which can definitely go a long way to reduce operational expenditure and guard a crop from these unfavorable conditions. If you have a high budget or a high value crop you might be looking at a closed greenhouse with filtered air again and you cannot use evaporative cooling at high humidities when the temperatures are also high so in this case you'd also have to use air conditioning it allows you to recover the CO2 as we've mentioned in which case you want a high insulation glazing again to save energy and it would definitely be useful to have a dynamic shading system if you can afford it. When you're in the hot and dry season and the sunlight intensity is excessive you can have your shading closed all the time or most of the time except for morning and evening and then during rain events or storms you have much less light and so shading to the same degree would bring it below optimal levels for your crop and that's when it would be nice to open the shading system because you're no longer so concerned about the sunlight's contribution to excess heat. If you have a low budget or a low crop value for example then you're going to want to go for an open greenhouse with screened air to keep the insects out. Static shading 
will be a lot better than nothing and you can rig it so that it can be manually operated as well when the need arises to remove it and root cooling becomes a very important strategy for managing your crop and alleviating the stress that comes from a suboptimal environment. In this case you're also going to go for a low insulation glazing because there's no heat or energy to lose here. It's a very low energy system that we're talking about. The takeaway from all of this that I want you to have is a general strategy that you apply to your scenario no matter what it is. First, you want to start by studying the value of your crop and the risks to your crop assuming that there's no environmental control. So, what is your crop worth if it's grown out in the field where you are? What are your expected yields? What are your expected qualities? And how much is this worth at market? Also, what are the risks that you might lose your crop or have significant crop losses? After that, you need to assess the costs locally of various forms of appropriate environmental control based on your assessment of your environment. You need to match the costs of these controls with their expected effects on your crop yields, quality, and risks. So, if a given component costs a lot of money, but only increases your yields a small amount, then it's likely not worth the investment compared to something that might be lower cost with a higher impact that will more quickly pay for itself and warrant its application. Next, you choose which controls to deploy based on your budget, the farm scale, and the acceptable return on investment period. Again, each control method and component of these greenhouse structures contributes certain effects in terms of controlling the environment in your greenhouse. This can create predictable crop yield increases and consistency and quality. You need to quantify that and compare the increase with the cost of this control. And your farm owner, for example, may have a limit on a return on investment period that they want to see. So they won't pay for control that takes more than five years to pay for itself in terms of the added money that you're getting from its application. Once you've chosen your course of action and the components that you want to use, educate yourself as best you can on the best ways to achieve consistent success using these methods. There are a lot of resources out there and books on everything we've just mentioned here. It's best to get serious about growing in a greenhouse and look into everything you can learn from other people's mistakes and research and writings so that you are as prepared as possible to make the most of the things that you invest in in the effort to increase your revenue and the long-term success of your farm business. I want to thank you all very much for your time and attention in attending this webinar and I hope that this has helped you learn a little bit about what the options are out there and how you can use them to increase your success. If you have any further questions then please follow up with our team so that we can answer them to your satisfaction. Have a wonderful day and happy growing!